I believe we are. No. No, not yet. Okay. Oh, yes, we are. Hello, and welcome to Inverticast. I am Leah from Tarantula and Inverticast. And of course, with me is Simon from the Mantis Garden. Hello, Simon. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Shame is promoted. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we do it every episode. Um, <laughs> but today, we are going to be discussing bees and all about bees. So that includes bumblebees, honeybees, wasps, and yellow jackets. Uh, Africanized killer bees. We're we're gonna talk about them all. So we should uh let's see what 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 do you want to get started with? Maybe um types of bees. Yeah, let's How do it. Okay. Are- yeah, there are so many types of bees. Um, I I know that there are 20,000 different species of bees throughout the entire world. Um, And specifically, there are 4,000 or approximately 4,000 that live here in the U.S. and Canada. Um, And then, yeah, so (laughs) there are a lot of species of bees, but most people probably only really think about like bumblebees or honeybees, maybe a little bit of wasps, you know, things like that. But um those are just like a tiny little glimpse into the world of bees. Yeah, there's, there's 2,000 2, species of bees in Europe. Oh, so yeah. You've got to beat by double in the Americas. Definitely. That's amazing. Although we do, I mean, that's probably due to the fact that like we have a bit larger of a landmass, but Europe is pretty big, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what that's including. I don't know if that's including Scandinavia and you know, extended True. Europe, Eastern Europe, and all the rest of it. And that that makes us a uh, big landmass. But I think you've got. I think you've got more of the um, the climate for for things as you have other books that we don't over here. And yeah, Europe. Uh, I think that's true. Hello, Shady. Shady says good evening. <laughs> good evening, Shady. Good evening. <laughs> All right, so um, I don't know like the specifics of each different kind of species of bees, but I do know that um, I would say that the most popular one or the most most recognized one is is definitely the honeybee, um, and there are so many species of those as well that uh, I mean it's hard to be like oh just one honeybee. No, there are so many honeybees. It's not even funny. So you got you know. Um, sorry, you got, you know, your, your Japanese honeybees, American honeybees, uh, there's European honeybees, African honeybees. So there's honeybees. They pretty much live all throughout the world, of course, except for like Antarctica, cause nothing really lives there except for penguins. <laughs> no spring time. Yeah. Right. That's okay. It. So. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything else to put uh, to add to um, what kind of bees there are in the world? Or well, obviously honeybees. We can obviously see this that you've done more swatting than I have about bees. Yeah. Uh, I know about the, the standard bees, like you know, your carpenter bees and uh, mason bees, etc., which are which are extremely interesting. Uh, the, the the difference is the way they they make the nests. Because when you when you when you think of a bee, most people think of a, a beehive, hanging uh-huh. from a, a, a tree branch, or even in your in your house somewhere, a, a, you know, under your gutter. Um, yeah. But lots of different ways. I mean, there's lots of bees. There's some bees that are actually just on their own, and they'll just dig a burrow into the ground and stay life on their own, sort of thing, and do it do it themselves. And there are other bees that make nests underground. With like a funnel on the top with 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 clay and they actually build it up like um a termite would build it up for coming out of the ground so you got little uh stalagmite 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 type structures coming up with a hole down yeah the the big and turret use, type uh, yeah they use the saliva and, and and mud to make like clay that's even more interesting it's actually waterproof uh, bees Saliva wow. is waterproof, which is awesome. So when it rains, it just comes off 
like it like it does have a duck's back which i think is interesting that's incredible i didn't know that that's it is really cool i mean these are pretty fascinating so i know that um here in the states we have paper wasps which we call them paper wasps but i'm going to guess that they're similar to the carpenter wasps and they will build you know these these big intricate kind of honeycomb looking hives um definitely in attics and kind of up high whereas like you were saying with the um Tourette building guys or bees um we have bumblebees that they actually burrow underground and they live in you know like in the shrubbery and stuff that uh accumulates around the forest floor or, or around the ground of trees and whatnot and so they'll just kind of burrow into that and that's where they live um so that's i mean that's definitely a fascinating thing uh, about what you know how they survive essentially um so carrie has asked uh if wasps actually have a good purpose outside of warding off children from port from parks <laughs> 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 and that's city of wasps are just horrible um, yeah yeah <laughs> but it's but it's like saying do cats or tigers have a purpose apart from just killing things um wasps are pretty much a cleanup crew because they they eat a lot of dead insects as well mm -hmm. they also catch a lot of uh things like flies and other annoying things like uh mosquitoes for instance mm -hmm. so they are a they're, they're particularly much a predator, um, but they're just annoying because they sting us and we don't like them. I mean, so <laughs> right. Us, but in the ecosystem, but like mosquitoes, they're annoying uh, to us. So therefore, we don't see them as a, a useful creature because we don't we don't find them particularly comfortable to live with. And it's just down to that's just down to humans. It's not down to the you know the ecosystem or the animal world. That's my opinion. Right. No, I think you're absolutely right. Um, they, you know, they do serve a purpose. Uh, even though we we definitely see wasps as you know kind of a pest, they do tend to build their nest around our houses and like you know can be very intimidating. Uh, as far as that goes, because you don't want to be stung by them. It is actually a pretty painful sting, um, more so than, than, you know, like a regular bee. Uh, but, I mean, it's it's not as bad as you might think. I mean, it's kind of a sting for sure, and it hurts. There's a lot of pain, you know, isolated at the at the sting site, and there's swelling. I'm sorry, Simon, you... That's, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> We had, when we moved in this house, we had, because you brought it to, to my mind there, we um, have a nest in an outside shed that was here. Uh, I, a paper wasp, European paper wasp. And I got suited up with everything, uh, <laughs> mask on and all that from uh, oh, yeah. everything. And I put a woolly hat on my head, thinking it was mm. protected. And... <laughs> Unfortunately not. And I went out with a, a CO2 fire extinguisher and froze uh -huh. it to get rid of it. And like they stung all the top of my head. Oh like, no. There been 50 stings on the top of my head. And that, that, oh, that goodness. seriously gave me a really, really bad headache. But apart from that, I mean I can say they're not they're not killer wasps, but you do right. sort of have some more dangerous ones when if you go in that territory uh painful and dangerous you're sliding towards hornets rather than wasps i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely um you know if you get stung enough it's definitely a dangerous thing because they they you know they you, they can send you to a hospital and then you'd yeah. have to be treated probably with a lot of benadryl <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah. anti-inflammatories um but yeah, um, wasps actually do serve a pretty pretty important purpose. Um, they are incidental pollinators, so yeah. they because they're carnivorous, so they they hunt and attack like other flying uh, insects, and that's basically what they eat. And they will also like attack you know big cicadas, and they will bring it back to the hive and feed that to their larvae or their the baby the baby wasps. Um, and the queen, of course. And so 
because of that, they are actually really great as far as keeping the pest populations down and keeping them in control. Um, and a lot of farmers here in the States actually uh, really like to use wasps as that kind of pesticide, like a natural pesticide uh, for their crops, which makes a lot of sense to me. It's kind of kind of hits back on that ladybugs, you know, harvesting ladybugs and using them as pesticides. Um, again, that it just makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, even a, even. Uh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Are you finished? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty finished with with the wasps. Um, so I, I think I just, just tail you off there by by putting in. I am sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, you're totally yeah. fine. It's, <laughs> um, I, I did read I, about um, there's some, there's something you do that we don't seem to do as much, which is is rent uh, bees, rent oh, bees, right. and then put them in your fields to pollinate. Yep. Yep, that is definitely something that is uh, done here in the States. I know for sure that here we have, um, I've mentioned them before on the podcast quite a few times, but the uh, Butterfly Pavilion here is a really huge, basically, bee superpower. Um, they will rent, like, little hives that you can take to, you know, like if you have a greenhouse or, um, you know, a garden in your house or, again, like a farm. And basically just allow the bees to do what they do. Um, and yeah, and everybody kind of benefits from that because the Butterfly Pavilion, you know, you're helping them and their program um, as far as conservation because they, they have a pretty good program for that. Um, and then you're also helping your own garden and your crops that you're trying to protect from other pests and critters that can really damage damage those plants. Um so speaking of conservation, uh, I thought that that would be, this is a good segue to talk about the conservation efforts that you read about recently. Well, it's, it's actually not a recent one. This has been going on for quite a while, but in the UK or in Britain, at least not in the UK, not uh -huh. um, there's something called a beeline, which is where we have uh, what they call uh, a nature setting, a wildlife setting. We we have uh, it's quite different from the from the states. We're okay. a bunch of cities in dots here and there across across the, the landscape, and in between that, we've got lots and lots of countryside. So what they've done is connect um, the the areas, you know, one nature area to another age, a nature area with like uh -huh. a transport system for bees, uh, oh. which is literally a strip of land that connects between the the the, the countryside areas the nature areas of uh -huh. uh, flowers that bees love basically and it's just oh, all that's amazing a network of, of flowers that go in lines to connect the bees to other places they want to go oh wow a fantastic idea and i'd love to see every other country do it well, I agree. I think that's that's really really something because, um, as we know, you know, bee populations across the whole world have been declining in recent years, um, actually for a couple of decades now, and so that program actually sounds really really great for the bees because I'm sure that you're probably also starting to see like a a boom in some of the populations of the bees there in in the UK. I can imagine that, that that's just, I mean, that's some of the best things that we can do. I mean, even here in the States, a lot of people like to plant flowers that are attractive, more attractive to honeybees and bees in general. So like lavender is a good one. Um, yep. Marigolds is another great one. I think sunflowers to an extent. I don't know if sunflowers are really that great. Um, but I do know that like that is something that we can do here at home. Uh, that will also help bee populations and help to keep them from starving. Um, you know, because without those flowers, they starve. Um, no, but without... When, when, they, when they have the gardens, it's like, if, you, if you've got a big enough garden, you know, save a bit, save a little corner. And, oh, yeah. And keep that little corner as wild as possible with wild flowers, everything yeah. in that little corner. 
because it doesn't absolutely helps a lot of insects and if it helps insects it helps the other animals etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a knock-on effect isn't it that's what the mm -hmm. ecosystem is really but yeah if you've, if you've got a garden that's big enough please keep a bit that's wild just absolutely wild and, and absolutely and grow wildflowers there and let the weeds grow as well because a lot of the weeds that we we don't like and we pull out of our garden are they're actually really beneficial weeds. and we're pulling them up so yeah. <laughs> right yeah, right i believe uh sunflowers here are also kind of considered a weed but they are super <laughs> beneficial they can be very like invasive so if you are planting sunflowers be aware of that they are an invasive plant um but they are pretty beneficial because, again, they provide a bit of pollen for the bees. Um, I think that's kind of, I'm playing on a stereotype here. <laughs> Anytime you see those pretty pictures of little bees and stuff, it's usually on a sunflower. Um, but I do know that marigolds, lavender, anything purple, any kind of purple flowers. Um, we have a flower here in Colorado that's native to Colorado called the columbine. And it is a, a absolutely beautiful flower. But very high in like pollen and so pollinators absolutely love columbines um so if you get your hands on some columbines and plant those but i agree um keeping the garden wild or to those wild native species of plants and whatnot is actually the most is the best thing you can possibly do for those bees it very very cool about the uh the sunflowers i've tried to grow <laughs> sunflowers in my garden for the past oh no 10 years and <gasps> they won't grow they won't grow at all because oh not no so it's like you know it's <clears throat> you're considering weeds and i can't get them to grow putting fertilizer on and looking after them <laughs> so it's so it's you know it's a good thing that you've got your perspective over there and then there's this i mean the rest yeah. of you are probably okay i've got to admit that it's probably us in scandinavia are gonna screw yeah. things like that but yeah um, <laughs> To see the different perspectives where you're saying, you know, you can just plant this, just plant that, and thinking, yeah, you can. But for us, it's 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 a little a little more difficult. It's di well, it's difficult. You you guys don't get quite as much sunlight as we do. Uh, is that pretty accurate? Yeah. I, I think it's the I think it's the the heat. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, it's like summer. We get we get uh, in winter. Sorry, we have more sunshine than we have in in summer. Mm. But it's that cold sun, so nothing grows. <laughs> yeah. But we, you know, it's like, uh, probably why we're so green, really, and rather than colourful. Um, like Ireland, it's it's the same sort of thing. It's 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 damp. Uh, yeah. Most of the time, and a lot of a lot of plants don't like that. So it's that's why I'm saying about the corner with the wild stuff in, because mm -hmm. that grows here anyway. So you know it's yeah. going to grow. Whereas if you if you're thinking of planting uh, sunflowers or anything else that bees are going to love, mm -hmm. it, your chances are pretty slim. Uh, unless you you know got your greenhouse and all the rest of the stuff, your your chances are slim. Sure, so, sure. Just yeah, just, climate does wild play. Flowers. Wild flowers look fantastic. Have you ever seen wild flowers that are all mixed up in a in a, in a oh garden, love them in a absolutely. I, I've got a, quite a big patch where I keep absolutely completely wild and i've got logs stacked up and all sorts of books and, and and baby birds and things awesome and that actually normally looks better than the part that i've i've got planted out um uh, shall we say properly <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. planted out properly but the the wild part when it in when it's at its height and everything all the different things that you've got corn flowers going and marigolds and open poppies and all uh -huh. sorts of will grow here naturally um natively sorry um sure they, they look absolutely fantastic look better than the rest really oh do. i love that that's amazing i can only imagine how how wonderful that must be um it's fantastic I, yeah, that's thing people yeah i mean i li living in the city i don't it's hard to to have a really nice garden because they do take a lot of time to you know procure and make sure that they're doing well um, but I do definitely enjoy seeing more native and wild species of flowers and plants and stuff coming, coming into other people's yards. And I think that's actually right now in the States, that's actually becoming a, a more popularized, um, uh, method 
of of grooming a yard is a, I'm starting to see a lot more people doing that exact thing where they're just allowing for the nat- native and and natural species of plants and stuff kind of over overthrow their yard essentially which makes a lot of sense because then you have a lot less maintenance you're not having to go out and mow your yard every you know week or so you're not having to water quite as much because again these native species they're they're going to thrive where they are from so when it rains that's the perfect thing um so yeah i'm really hoping that i see a lot more of that but i definitely have noticed that it's definitely a a, a really good trend okay right. so Funny, fantastic. I mean, my, my wife is from Africa, so yep. living here, when she sees weeds that I would consider like horrible, uh, pull uh-huh. off and get rid of them, she's like, no, no, leave that, they're beautiful. And, you know, so it has a completely different perspective. So if <laughs> I went to the States, what, what, what you yeah. consider weeds, I might find really attractive and think that has a beautiful flower, you know, or, or, yeah. plant or, or whatever. It's a difference when when you go to different countries. What one considers a weed, another one is cultivating to put in the gardens on purpose. Mm. That's, that's what you seem to find around around the world. Certainly, I mean, I think it's really fascinating the differences and um, what we consider something that is awesome and beautiful, and that we want to cultivate a lot more of them. And you know what some people consider weeds. I think that's that's a very interesting. Uh, like a signal of kind of what culturally like the differences that we all have. I think that's a really, really good point for sure. Um, So let's talk about why bees are such important pollinators in the world and why conservation efforts are so important in keeping these bees around and making sure that they don't ever go extinct, obviously. So you mentioned this actually backstage or earlier we were discussing why bees were so important. And we read a statistic, we know of a statistic that says that bees are, and pollinators in general, are responsible for one in three bites of food for like worldwide for people. Um, and that's that's a pretty big statistic if you think about it. That's a third of all of the food that's ever produced throughout the world, uh, and that that bees and pollinators are responsible for that third of food. So um, I think that's probably the biggest reason that they're so important is because of that food production um, and that pollination that that creates that food production. Um, obviously, because food is actually an essential for for humans like we can't survive without food clearly (laughs) same with water we can't survive without water um so what are your thoughts on that simon like what what do you think uh why why else do you think that these bees are so important for pollinators pollinizers i mean uh, well 90 percent i did read this uh days ago i'm I'm going to say it amazingly uh, 90% of the world's food crops are pollinated by insects. Oh, wow. And that's a lot. 90% is a lot. So if you think about it, if you if you say there's people in the world now starving to death, uh-huh. can you imagine taking another 90% of the world's food away? Oh, it would that, be devastating. That's what would happen if we start squashing all the bugs we see. Um, mm-hmm. This is why insects in general are so important, but the vast majority, about 90%, is bees mm-hmm. that are actually doing all the pollinating. And it, like I said before, there's, there's, a, there's a massive, massive amount of bees. Some bees only go for red flowers, some only go for yellow flowers, mm-hmm. some for the purple flowers. I don't know about the eyesight of bees, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I pretty lacking on that information but if anybody else knows please let us know why that is i i do know that their eyesight is very similar to almost like infrared so the brighter like purple and blue hues tend to be the ones that they're more attracted to so that looks a lot brighter to them um and of course i think yellow and 
some orange hues are also very vibrant for them. Um, but yeah, their eyesight is, is kind of a mystery to me as well. <laughs> well just, just picking certain colors though for one species and being like mm -hmm. I, I, I only eat red flowers you know that must be hard work flying around looking Absolutely. for the red flowers only you know did, did you know just talking about the flowers did you know there's actual bee that makes a burrow in the ground and it wallpapers it's the entire burrow with petals and flowers oh wow no i had no idea that's amazing it cuts off little little petals little bits of petal flies back yeah. to the burrow and glues them to the to the inside of the burrow with saliva and out again it goes and gets more wow that's incredible i had no idea and i, I just, just yeah, I was like, <laughs> right yeah just, just, for it. I, I agree i couldn't find a reason for them doing it nobody seems to uh have studied that but they well, don't, I'm wondering. They don't know why they do it I'm wondering if they do it because possibly there's there might be like a chemical or something within the flower petal itself that, you know, provides some kind of sustenance for them possibly. Or um, I'm wondering if it also might have to do with like keeping predators away because you know that there are some plants that are um, actually uh, really, really good like insecticide essentially like pine here for instance yes yeah, um, uh, yeah you know pine pine is something that we know that spiders and bees are just they're they're put off of they don't like it it's very off-putting to them um so they avoid it you know same with peppermint and these are known to be plants so i'm wondering if that that specific bee or that specific flower has some kind of you know that kind of uh uh, attribute that helps them to stay away from from other carnivorous insects. It could be, but I prefer to think they just like the color. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice on the wall. You, know. well, you, know, you never know. Yet, I, I, I'll keep that in my mind until somebody actually make, writes a paper on it and says why. But I'm going to keep that in my mind because I think that's a much more romantic view of it. But, yeah, I agree. We'll we'll go with that. That it's it's much more aesthetically <laughs> pleasing to them than. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. And I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> All <laughs> right. I love that though. That that's some pretty interesting information about certain species. I mean, they each have their own like qualities that are just like so much cooler, or inch more interesting than the next. I would say, um, and I think that's that's another reason that you know they're they're just such a cool, interesting little invert, you know. Um, so we are also going to talk about bees that kill other bees, and I think and a great example of that would be uh, the in Japan the Japanese honeybees. There's there's a type of wasp that actually will attack the Japanese honeybee. Uh, hives and so you know and i know that there are some yellow jackets and wasps and whatnot that will attack other beehives and things like that um we also have tarantula hawks that will attack and kill a tarantula and then lay their eggs in in the tarantula's body so that when the larvae hatch they have something to munch on um so yeah let's you know, kind of delve into bees that eat and kill or kill and eat other bees. Um, what do you think the purpose of that is? Like what? Lunch. What? Lunch. <laughs> right? Yes. What's the, the purpose it? of anything? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the, I don't think there's any real purpose. I mean, it's just already evolved. It's just gone. This is an yeah. easy meal, you know? It's yeah. an easy meal. We've got this sauce. We'll add these. We'll, you know, we'll snack on this. It's sure probably just how they, you know, evolved in general. Right, it's, right, right. Like, no, I just you think why? Why do they eat them? It's it's just because it's easy, I suppose. A bit like pandas giving up on chasing <laughs> things when I mean, they can just sit there and chew on bamboo. They thought this is easy. I'm going to do this instead. So <laughs> that's true how, true, you know, true. That sort of bees have evolved uh, and that 
the hornet she talked about in in ja Japan. Uh, I cannot mm -hmm. remember the name for the life of me. I did know the Latin name for them as well. Um, oh. But those are, are absolutely fascinating. The way they go and the the amount of beings they can kill. I think I think it's something like is it twenty a minute something like that they can go. Oh through. wow! No, so, I I don't know. Yeah, it's just like crunching them, and and then the only defense the bees have when they get in to the hive is by swarming them into uh -huh. the box, flapping their wings really hard and rising the temperature within yes. the bottle and it kills the wasp because the bees can handle the temperature it gets over mm -hmm. 40 degrees centigrade in there which is uh i think that's nearly 100 degrees fahrenheit something i like believe that. it's and it gets well, so hot there, it kills the wasp and the bees yeah. are like, yeah, we're all right now. They, they, the bees can handle it. The wasps can't, but that's that's how they see them off to the best of the ability. But if they get swarmed by the wasps, as you said, by the yeah, wasps, they're doomed. Uh, they're done for. They're just they're done for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Which I is, think it's pretty interesting and very impressive how they interact with one another and are able to work as a team like that. It's almost you know that hive mind. I think we've talked about this before when we were talking about ants, yeah. um, that they all just kind of have that one mission. They know what it is. They, you know, they go for it. Um, and Japanese honeybees are no exception to that. So I think they do actually, they raise the temperatures to like close to 120 degrees. Is it? Which, yeah, I believe so. I think it's like 115, 120, somewhere in that range. Um, and which is, you know, obviously detrimental to the wasp. But like you said, those honeybees are able to withstand that kind of a temperature, um, which also raises the CO2 levels in the hive. So they basically boil and <laughs> suffocate the wasp to death, um, which is pretty fascinating. And then I, I'm, I can imagine that they probably just use the, the dead wasp as some kind of sustenance or you know, maybe a part of the hive eventually. I mean, it all breaks down, of course, but that's it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I, most most like honeybees and like bumblebees and those kinds of bees are actually stingless, so they don't have stingers, uh, meaning that you know they they can't sting you, so they're not quite as defensive. They're also not quite as aggressive as some wasps and yellow jackets can be. Um, so speaking of aggressive bees, <laughs> uh, Carrie asks, do killer bees make honey? So this is a really great question and a really great segue into killer bees. What are they? Are they really that bad? Um, and I actually did a whole bunch of research on killer bees and come to find out that killer bees are also known as Africanized honeybees. So they yes do produce honey um but the the reason they exist is because of us so <laughs> back in the 1950s uh, uh some scientists or people you know brought these african honeybees into brazil and hybridized them with the brazilian honeybees in an effort to create more honey production so they wanted to produce a lot more honey Unfortunately, some of those bees escaped the laboratories where they were being cultivated, essentially, uh, and have pretty much scattered and spread throughout the entire world, um, including like the southern most parts of, of um, the United States. But they, you can find them pretty much in Africa, South America, Central America. And any place that's pretty warm, you're probably going to find some Africanized honeybees. Um, the funniest thing about them, though, I think, is that, the, you know, we've been, people have been trying to control them for decades and decades, but unfortunately, it's just, they're very, very tricky to control. And the reason that they have been given the, the name of killer bees is because they are much more aggressive and much quicker than any other bee. So if you disturb a hive, one of their hives or something like that um they're going to be much more quick to attack you and there's going to be a lot more of them and they are incredibly aggressive so because of that 
they have been known to kill people, which is a shame. But Africanized honeybees, so they do produce honey. Good question. Mm, very good. Very good question. They're also very good for movies. Oh, absolutely. They make yeah. really great uh, inspiration for movie antagonists and scary monsters, right? <laughs> I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of movies put things into people's heads and make things mm -hmm. worse than they are now. The, the spiders are a good, you know, good uh, example of that. Way, way people are afraid of spiders. They know people are afraid of spiders in general, so they make yes. them bigger, they make them area, they make you know, they make them more yeah. aggressive. Put them on the screen, and if if you don't really know much about something. And you're being shown this that's what you believe and that's so, yeah that's what you're gonna have you know they're not as uh i mean they are aggressive obviously they're much more aggressive than the other bees but mm -hmm. they're not gonna chase you down like in the cities and then go on to the next person and murder you no. this, 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 is, <laughs> this is the sort of mentality that hollywood has produced uh yes. rather than you know scientists but again humans bring in this problem around i mean it's always it's always humans every time you look at something. it's always people always it <laughs> <laughs> no i ab i absolutely yeah. agree it, it's so true i mean uh the africanized honeybees are they're honestly yeah they're more aggressive than regular bees but if you're not going out of your way to like mess with them, you're gonna be fine. They're probably not gonna come after you. So I, I appreciate that you mentioned that uh, Hollywood and sometimes the media really likes to make things a lot scarier and more outlandish than they actually are. Um, I think unfortunately, like bees, spiders, and snakes really get the yeah. the worst of it. To be honest, like yeah, they do, they do, they do. I think spiders yeah. get the worst, and then you got bees that. Well, yeah. I don't know for you because it might be snakes for you. For us, we don't have any, so it's like oh, okay. snakes. <laughs> wow, I well, didn't know that. So the UK nothing here that's particularly dangerous. We have no tarantulas, nothing like no. that. The yeah. biggest spiders about I'm gonna have to do this about an inch and a half, inch maybe an inch and a half. Sure. Every year in September, <laughs> conveniently, the newspapers will come out with. Oh, it's spider time, and there are going to be <laughs> massive giant spiders running across your floor. Just, just you know, the usual media rubbish where they're trying to terrify people to right. buy a paper or whatever. And it's uh, it's the same with every country. Whatever they've got the most of, that's what the you know the media comes up and says. This is terrifying. It's Absolutely. Just, it's just publicity stunts, isn't it? Really. All yeah, of. definitely. I mean, I think it's really kind of an unfortunate side of kind of humanity and just how we kind of function, if you will. Yeah. Because we, I mean, we know that fear is a really great motivator. So there's a lot of things in the media and sometimes here in the States, like we know this firsthand is, you know, you drudge up a bit of fear about one thing, then that means that people are going to go out and, you know, be buying things to help prevent that one thing or they're going to be buying things to help like prepare for that one thing you know i think um i think that that's just just a part of 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 the world and just kind of how we how we work together i if you will but it's it's very unfortunate i do agree i feel like if people were maybe a little more educated on you know what the purpose of bees or wasps or even the the africanized honeybees you know, then they probably wouldn't be quite as fearful. Um, and we'd probably have a lot better environment happening, you know, a better ecosystem, because then things would be a lot more copacetic. Hopefully people would be a lot more relaxed and not quite as fearful. Um, because let's be honest, who wants to live in fear? That's not a fun time. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, it's not only that. You get, because, it's because of the fear factor, because it's only a book, yeah. People kill them. And it's like, you know, yeah. you, you just killed somebody's lunch there. You know? Right, exactly. You, you just... but if you look at it like that, if you say, like, every time you kill a bee, you're just yeah. killing somebody's lunch. Somebody's going hungry because you killed that bee. Right. Rather than 
you know, catching it, releasing it outside of your house or wherever you found it, like, you know, that, that was a wasp's lunch. Like, they, they were going to take care of it for you rather than you doing it on your own. It just it kind of sucks. <laughs> so I, I definitely hear you on that. Fall down, something's going to eat them. So right. it's, it's, it's all a, a knock-on effect rather than you just flattening it on your window. <laughs> it's, it's not yeah, it. yeah. Just make well, the effort you know, your window. Shoot it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's part of the, the chain, essentially. Everything is eaten by something else. So yeah. there's, you know, there's big fish eat the little fish, but then there's a much bigger fish that's going to eat that other big fish, you know. So it's, it's just kind of, it, it, I feel like it's just kind of weird and redundant. It's just a weird part of society that we play on our own fears in that way. Um, and it's detrimental to a lot of bee species and, you know, other invert species, especially like spiders, and, you know, um, yeah. elder beetles, box eetle, or the box elders, you know, it's, they have a purpose. And even if that purpose is just being food for another <laughs> invert, like, it's important. Um, okay, so the last topic that I have is parasites and pests. So what kind of parasites and pests do bees also have to uh, navigate? What is the word I'm looking for? Mitigate? No. Uh, navigate would do. It's like, you know, navigate away <laughs> from them. Um, yeah. I know because I breed wax worms. And when I got into this a long time ago uh, and researching, because I, I was like, Okay, wax worms. Uh -huh. I know you're getting at the pet shop, but I, I didn't, you know, where do they come from in, in reality? Where do they live in nature? And when right. I found out, I was very surprised that they actually live in, in beehives. And the reason they're called wax worms is because they eat bees' wax. So oh, that's amazing. Hive, which is an actual nightmare. They can actually collapse a, a complete hive, uh, killing off the, the entire colony. Oh, wow. So tiny little moth larva can do that <laughs> it's, it's i find that completely amazing sorry i've got cramped in my head oh no <laughs> <laughs> it's just going the back of my thigh <laughs> oh no yeah, I, I can imagine it. yeah but yeah it's it, it's um i, I think that's because well, <laughs> yeah, you were... that nice wax worms but uh, very few people uh, meal ones are another one it's like Mm -hmm. He really sits down when they buy these these food for their animals and goes, I wonder where this comes from in nature. I wonder where it turns mm -hmm. into. Uh, but there you go. Waxworms are a, a nightmare for uh, beekeepers. So we tell wow. I That's have a amazing. friend who's a beekeeper. Or I had a friend who was a beekeeper. He said, go to a writing club with her. And she, she wrote a book on bees. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. And uh, <laughs> she keeps bees in... The nearest city's cathedral she keeps them in in on the top on the roof of the old bell tower oh it's wow like, it's just cool it's right in the middle of the city and it is amazing like the ives on, on the top of this uh on top of the bell tower which i think is a, a fascinating weird thing anyway but yeah, yeah. she's telling me about wax worms how, how they can can, can, uh, can completely uh ruin a colony just just <laughs> For a moth getting in there and laying its eggs could be a disaster. Wow. Which is, you know, and then you've got the the other parasites, which which we all know because we've seen them on ants, we've seen them on wasps, which is the uh, zombies. Where you get the zombie um, fungi. Oh, a, right. It out of the bee if it, if it gets yeah. covered. So it's, it's, that's another one. That's another parasite. Uh, it's not a parasite, is it? What is it? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. Because it's a zombie fungus, it uses the a bee body basically to to procreate and to create more yeah. of that zombie zombie fungus. So I definitely think it would be a parasite. Absolutely. Yeah, I know, but the scientists, I mean, any scientists or entomologists watching would say, "No, that's not a parasite. That's a <laughs> and, you know, it's a, a fungusite." I don't know. <laughs> it should be so oh, yeah. Name for it. They've always got a weird name for everything, haven't they? You know, it's it's. And if you I'm pretty it, sure. 
I'm pretty so, sure it classifies as a parasite, absolutely, because it's it's using another life form for its yeah. own life, right? I mean, that's essentially the the what a parasite is. So yeah, it yeah. makes sense. I mean, yeah. bees are also they can also be affected by um, nematodes and oh uh, yeah, you know other things like that. So there's quite a few things to uh, to bother bees. They're not they're those not dreaded. Dreaded nematodes, man. Oh, yeah, okay. I don't like nematodes at all. No, they're all old things. But yeah, so, some of them are beneficial. So there you go. But yeah. Uh, yeah, the bees are, are not indestructible, and you know, the, you see a bee and you think, "Oh, look at that cute little bee." It might contain a hairworm, for instance, uh -huh. which is another another nasty thing that infects uh, animals, makes them go into the water. And drown themselves, oh, geez. which is you know again, nobody knows that how. Is. They're assuming that it's some kind of neural uh, interface that the, that the parasite has with the bug's brain. Mantis get it also hairworms, where absolutely they'll they'll get to a certain size where they need to come out to get into the water, and they'll uh -huh. send the bug into the water to drown itself, and then they'll just come out when it hits the water. So wow. That's a, yet another one uh, that can affect bees and many Absolutely. other bees. Absolutely. That's a fun one. I don't, it's not really a parasite. Uh, the oil beetle. Oh, yeah, people. Absolutely. <laughs> We're oh, probably the, the oil beetle. Oil beetle. Oil, oh, the oil beetle. Okay. Yeah, which that, that actually can climb <laughs> up to the top of the plant and sit on the flowers, the lava. Loads of them can sit on the flowers. Uh -huh. Wait for a bee to arrive like a taxi crawl on the bee and then fly off to another flower and that's basically how they get around which is which is quite you know if you think about how that could have evolved it's just crazy <laughs> ideas that this beetle lab has gone i i know we'll fly up top here wait on the flowers jump on the next bee and then we'll move on to the next place we'll get a lift off the bee basically i, I think that's uh, <laughs> That's quite quite amusing, but as you say that's really interesting. Fascinating, well, fascinating. Where am I? I, I? I'm from Greek all of a sudden, right? But yeah, one of the one of the most fascinating ones is is the one you mentioned, and you'll know more about it than I do because you have them and we don't. It's just the, okay. the tarantula wasp. Oh is right. The opposite of par it's a parasite, basically, isn't it? Really, it's yeah, uh, kind of. It, it well, yeah. Again, there's a word for that um the parasite i think will do because it's it's preying on another creature but in, in a weird way i mean wait it just stings it paralyzes it keeps the spider uh -huh. alive for months yep while the lava eats the insides of the spider absolutely it's yeah it's, it's, it's disgusting it's gross <laughs> yes it's absolutely, absolutely disgusting. I mean, the fact that it's bad enough that it's, it's stung it and paralyzed it and then laid its eggs in it, but to keep yeah. it alive so it's fresh, while it's yeah. maybe... That's is, next level. That's like right. next level. I know people yeah. say to me and say about mantis, is like, oh, but it eats it alive. Yeah, but it takes them about five minutes. Where right. Like, Not like a few months. <laughs> yeah, this, this puts are actually eaten alive from the inside out, but it's tiny, tiny little worms, which are basically our worms, that little larva. And yeah, yeah. Eating it slowly while well, it's alive, and it must be from the inside out too. Like that's that's got to be excruciating, right? I mean, ugh. horrible. <laughs> well, that's another thing about bugs, um, with the pain, mm. because I, I I've read conflicting papers on pain in invertebrates. Um, oh, and I interesting. Don't believe they both come up with with. A decent amount of proof on both sides that there is pain and there isn't pain and what they're sure. saying is some some bugs actually or all bugs um don't register pain they register damage oh and that's the reason why they like things like crickets and whatnot when you pick them up with your tweezers they can just say just lose a legging and just run off they don't care right. they don't bleed to death they they prepare to accept that damage Whereas a mantis, if a mantis molts badly, let's say a leg, uh -huh. quite happily, it'll chew its own leg off if it's in the way. 
you know, if it's dragging or something, it'll chew its own leg off and carry on. That's and amazing. Like a, a, a pain, a pain versus uh, damage registration. So instead of so instead of pain, it's the damage. Yeah, it's sort of, it's brains going. Okay, that 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 leg's got something wrong with it. I don't need that leg. Or right. Whatever part of the body is. I don't know how that affects like if you ever if you ever seen well you, of course you've seen it when mm. you put a cockroach in with a spider and the spider bites it. Yeah. The cockroach doesn't act like it's in terrible pain. It just looks like it wants to get away because it's been grabbed hold of like as if you picked it up. It, it doesn't seem to be in excruciating pain. It's not flailing or anything. No, so I can imagine like that. That's why we. I think that's why we associate those kind of reactions from from say you know the tarantula bite with the cockroach. That's probably why we associate that with a pain response. Is because you're absolutely right. They kind of look like they're just trying to get away, moving their little legs around, um, you know, and in an in an effort to run away. So. That makes a lot more sense that they are just registering. Oh, I'm damaged. Whatever yeah. damaged me, I'm. I got to get away from the damage, right? Um, yeah. That's fascinating. That's, that's sort of. If that's the case, then the tarantula wasp laying its eggs in there. Uh huh. Now it becomes a different sort of scenario. Is that as bad as what we can imagine if somebody laid eggs in us and it was eating us from the inside bit by bit? You know. Right. Is it as Wonder bad? They can't I wonder if it's the same kind of neuroreceptors, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because when we are in pain, then that's it, essentially what it is, is also damage for sure, because then yeah. our body will go and, and heal whatever it is that's causing us pain. But at the same time, the nerves and the neurons are sending that message to our brain saying, okay, this is pain, this is pain, there's something wrong. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it's almost, if they're similar in that in that way that's I, really fascinating i don't know I, I, the one of the papers said to get the message mm. that, that something's wrong in an area and they know what the area is whereas we right. need pain in that area for us to know where it is if that right. makes sense does that make sense no it does total sense like a yes, broken their, finger their, their brain or a lot of them don't even have uh, a lot, a lot of things don't actually have brains, as we nope. call them brains. They have a neural ganglia. Like, mm -hmm. like snails, snails have a neural gang ganglia. They don't actually mm -hmm. have a brain, a, a, what we would see as a brain. So it makes sense that less information would get there and need to mm -hmm. be processed. Whereas ours is very complicated. Um, with, with that There's a, a total system. system. Yeah. You know, we have different kinds of pain as well. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that's something we have, else we so we know when we've been burnt, we know we've been pricked. We you know yeah. you know when we've been trapped or banged. We know the difference between the pains. Whereas mm -hmm. the insects, are they noticing the difference? Or are they just noticing that leg has got damage? Right. So wow. It, like it, it comes out of live feed and all sorts of things. Is it bothering the bug that it's been live fed at all? You know, does, right. does it happen to it? Or does it just keep going? Oh, that leg's got damage. Oh, the other leg's got damage. <laughs> you know, that's is very that, fascinating. That all that's happening? Or is it really screaming in agony silently? Right, right, right. What, I don't know how we would ever be able to discern, to like discern that. I I would assume there needs to be a lot of research into it if you know if it's something that was interesting. And tiny uh, little probes. <laughs> yeah, right. Tiny little, <laughs> tiny little probes. Really tiny little probes. Like That's where the things go down. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I, I, I think love we it. We digress there from bees somehow. A little Sorry. bit, but that's okay. That's okay because beans. Uh, bees can inflict a lot of damage and pain, so it works. <laughs> I, I, the, it's a good point, actually. I wonder when when a bee stings, let's say a wasp, for instance, as it's attacking it, it stings it. Uh -huh. I think the wasp feels anything. Well, 
I, you know, that's a really great question because they do, like, when they sting, they do have a venom that comes yeah. with their stinger. So I'm what, yeah, I agree. I wonder if, you know, a wasp that's been stung by, you know, a yellow jacket or something, if it's a painful, it could be a painful experience, maybe something similar to what we experience. I don't think so, but I wonder if it's more like neurotoxin to where maybe it kind of paralyzes them or just kind of shuts down their, you know, their uh, central nervous system or something like that. So that's, that's a really good question, Simon. <laughs> with, the, with the pain thing, we could, I could probably go on all day and come up with examples. <laughs> sure. Get off that subject quickly because I've got loads of them in my head now whizzing round, which, <laughs> which are just, you know, not completely off topic. So, yeah, stick to bees, Simon. <laughs> No, you're doing you're you're awesome. I appreciate everything today. You you've done a fantastic job with information about bees and pain receptors. It's it's awesome. Very very cool. We're actually rounding out to the end of our podcast. So Simon, do you have anything that you would like to plug for this week? What you got going on? The shameless plug. <laughs> I have nothing same as usual. Go to my channel, give it a subscribe, yeah. new videos, yeah, like it if you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really, yeah, just do that. That's All right. And buy All mantis right. for me. <laughs> yeah, I, you said you've been breeding a lot of mantises this week, right? Because the heat wave that you guys had, so uh, a lot of them are ready for that. Yeah, I got a lot Did of you... guys knocking around that are waiting to be bred. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be doing a stream. One day this week, hopefully with Shady uh, again. We yeah. did one last week, but hopefully we'll do one again this week. Oh, um, I hope so too. Attempt to pair a mantis because I she she just bought some mantis. The last oh, show awesome! Was, and I have the same mantis that are ready to pair. So I was hoping we could pair it on stream, and she could watch me pair them. And uh, and when she comes to to do hers, it'll be. She'll have something there. Uh, yeah. But we tried last week and was unsuccessful. So Aww. we'll have to wait until did, this week and see if we'll try them again. But did you happen to find uh, Did you happen to find the spiny flower mantis uh, female? I did. I found you several, did? several of them. Yes. Yes. So I now have three females there and one male who's very traumatized. <laughs> He's got PTSD, I'm afraid, at the moment. So oh, no. <laughs> we've got to give him a few days and try him again because uh, they're very, very aggressive. Very yeah, aggressive. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. Ridiculously Aren't... aggressive. One of the most aggressive mantis. Um, wow. So, yeah. It, it's uh, As soon as the male gets on, nine times out of ten, she's trying to kill him. So, oh, wow. You know, yeah. You intervene, stick your finger in there and intervene. Otherwise, he'd be lunch. So, yeah, he's yeah. a at the moment. <laughs> he's had three of them <laughs> eating. So we're going to take a break, and then we'll try him again. Oh, yeah. poor guy. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be fine. Sure. Um, let's see what I've got going on. I've got baby Philippus Audux that oh. I'm trying to find people who want them. Um, here, obviously, in Denver, I can't really ship because I'm just... I'm low level. I'm not even a breeder, really. But um, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of little baby spoons that are absolutely ready for new homes. And this week, I will. I just released my Holothele longapes rehouse and species spotlight uh, video yesterday. And then this upcoming week, I had a couple of uh, little slings that are now well. They're still pretty slingish, if you will. Um, but a couple of old world cool little baboon tarantula species that uh, I rehoused. So be looking forward to that uh, video and it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and tiny plastic babies. That's like a thing for me now. I'm putting these in every little enclosure that I've got. So look out for the tiny plastic babies. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, so it was good. It's been a good week. Simon, as always, it's a pleasure to talk with you and you. doing our, our invert chat. And uh, I really enjoyed talking about bees. And thank you so much for being here. And yeah.
anytime. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching. We are going to sign off. Um, as always, you can find us on YouTube and obviously uh, Facebook and other cool places. So, yeah. Bye, guys. See you later. <laughs>